We now welcome on to the podcast, Ryan Johansson. Ryan, good to see you again, man. What's up, man? This is uh, is, it, is this my my third appearance on the on the Patrick Jones podcast? Yeah, you're a recurring guest, uh, one of the few re- reoccurring guests. But um, it's good it's good to have you back on for sure. What we need like a more of a routine set schedule for you to come on. <laughs> well, yeah, I, uh, I appreciate. it. I think I recorded one while I was driving a U-Haul truck. Uh, I think I was in Arizona for another one and I was out outside pacing in the neighborhood, uh, when we, when we did it. Um, so it's nice to be grounded here, here in the, the old <laughs> office because it's an igloo outside in Chicago. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit better here in Ohio, but yeah, I can't imagine Chicago. Um, I know before we started recording, we were talking about like some of the stuff that, you know, we were going to discuss and talk about and. And I was thinking that, you know, I, I feel like you're somebody who would be perfect for for this discussion because, you know, you've been, you know, you've been a coach, you've been in the private sector, but you've also been in, in professional baseball too. And you've been in a leadership position as a, as a coordinator in professional baseball. And so, you know, you're someone who is really systematized and, and organized. And um, I think that would be, it's very, would be very beneficial, I think, for, for coaches out there, myself even included, um, just to kind of hear your thought process when it comes to uh, building out systems for for hitting development. Yeah, that's been um, <clears throat> that's been a journey for sure, and, and something I enjoy talking about, just because I know some of the challenges that I faced um, having a facility with tons of tech and no system in place. Mm. Um, so trying to figure out like how do how do first of all how do I scale myself as a hitting coach. Um, and how do I scale using information for hitting coaches? So there's kind of like the the how to coach, and then there's like the what to coach. Um, so I think it just goes it just goes back to like really identifying like what you care about. And my brain kind of works in flow charts. So um, as I kind of think about this, like at the top, like what do I care about most, and then each category, like what falls under there and what falls under here, and you kind of figure out a way. Um, to implement those strategies and uh you've got to figure out like how you crush the top ones right like if you can't crush the top ones then we can't trickle down um or you can look at it the other way and you could say hey like i've got to start at the bottom and i've got to work my way up but i think a lot of people try to start in the middle of what they care about in terms of you know if there's a blast sensor or, or something of that nature and it's in the it's in your iphone and you've got another coach you're trying to deliver information to and you're stuck screenshotting or putting into Google sheets and people are trying to figure out the links and there's all kinds of challenges that, that go into that. Um, and then, then you've got to figure out like, okay, is the coach even interpreting the information the same way I would be interpreting it? So what are our definitions? Um, how do we define to the player what rotational acceleration is or what vertical forces or any of the other possible um, metrics you can kind of look at? Um, and then how does it apply practically, right? that's great that we've got all these, you know, sexy names and we sound really smart and all those um, kind of all those more scientific, uh, you know, approach, but what, how are we applying that in the cage? Um, And kind of what is the, what is the step to take to get the player to be like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. Like I got this. Um, And I know what improvement looks like as opposed to just like, Hey, did my number get better? Mm -hmm. Um, they can actually feel the improvement. They want to know when they want to check it. They based off ball flight, based off of what they felt in their body, like, Oh, that one. Um, so that's kind of my, my initial rant as we start this conversation, so to speak, or my initial ramble wasn't really a rant, but what would be for you, you mentioned like starting at the top, right. The the things that you value most, like for you specifically, like what would, what what would those be? Yeah. So that's a really good question. I think depending on the audience, it potentially changes, but I think we're at a point now where like, I've really tried to communicate with, I I want, I want to be in line with almost everybody in the room. Right. And so I've kind of picked out um, our three core values are balance, path, and power. I think if you and I are in a, a a major league clubhouse or a minor league clubhouse with hitting coat with eight hitting coaches, I think everybody can resonate with that. Um, I don't think anyone's going to be like, what balance? Like, no, I want my hitter to be off balance. Right. I don't think anyone's going to be like, you know, path. Why does that matter? Like, or like, no, no, we don't need to focus on power. Like hitting for power is stupid. Right. So that's kind of like how I, how I picked out those three. And um, 
for balance, it's really, I guess, the metrics that we've had and what we've built out, like really encompass all three of them. Like we've tried to figure out like almost like the Amazon core value approach of like every bucket we care about, like everything we do should fit into each bucket. Mm -hmm. Um, but just to kind of break it down, like for balance, it's force plate data. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to test every player with force plates. It just means I know what I've learned from force plates and I know what the best in the world do on force plates. And so as I explain it, I know that we're going to try to get um, some torque into the back, back hip when we load. I know we're going to try to uh, hold uh, our center of mass and our <clears throat> hold pressure down to our back foot as we go forward. And I know we're going to transfer a ton of weight into our lead leg um as we go through so kind of if i can hit those three things and put some metrics to it i can define it so if i were to get on a force plate i could say hey yes he accomplished this or he did not accomplish this but practically it looks like hey are you in control of your body can you start slow and early and do you transfer your weight so um but i think if if you don't if you just have if you don't have the metrics attached to that kind of conversation with other coaches as you're trying to scale are you in control of your body is going to mean something different. Mm. Did you transfer your weight is going to mean something different and, or did you stay back is going to mean something different. So by putting some objective measurements, it's how we can kind of like define things across all levels. If coaches are listening to this and, and they don't have access to some of the, some of these pieces of tech, I mean, do you think that they should just have on video, like have certain checkpoints for, for them? Like, how do you think they should go about if they just have an iPhone? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think, um, I don't think you need to measure it, like to teach it. I, I don't think you're going to, for most coaches out there, you're not going to have access to force plates and they're really cool. But for the most part, I think at this point in the industry, like you're either going to find something like really, really minute in the best players, like, Hey, I'm, I'm already a major, major league player, excuse me, sorry. Um, I'm already a major league player or I'm a minor league player. That's really close or I can't figure it out. But I think, I don't, I don't think you need to put every single person on a force plate, but I think if you were to, um, I think, I don't know if Burtek still has it, but go take the Burtek course on like what you're going to get out of force plates, just understanding how the best in the world move. And then, yeah, when you use your iPhone, you can talk to players about that and take some videos and um, things of that nature. But a uh, video is another great, uh, another great tool. Um, on base you, I think does a good job with like kind of their swing characteristics. They've kind of scaled that right through video. Like, what does this look like? What is, and then identifying different moves with their lines and, all the other things from there. But um, yeah, it's a great point. Just kind of identifying what you care about and then defining it, I think is step one to, to scaling anything. So you mentioned force plates. Is there anything else? Like, <clears throat> is there anything else that's like on that top, top tier for you besides uh, like balance? I know you mentioned direction and things like that. Like how would you measure direction? Like, would that be something, again, you're just looking at video and then you're teaching coaches off of that? Yeah, I think you can definitely use uh, video to to discuss direction. You know, a lot of people call it creating space or, um, you know, there's a variety of different different terms. I think if you were to ask 10 coaches what direction means, they you, you might get 10 different answers or at least maybe five different answers. Mm -hmm. um, direction for us is pretty simple. It's uh, how stable um, are the shoulders kind of rotating around the spine. So um, if you think of something like KVEST or 4D motion or 3D motion capture, you're, you're going to see the spine. You're, you're going to see like uh, as it rotates, it's going to it's either going to be really stable or it's going to kind of like fall forward or fall back or as it rotates, pull up. Um, and then you can kind of look at like, OK, well, what's the pelvis doing? Is the pelvis putting the putting the spine out of whack? Is it the shoulders? Is there a lack of stability somewhere? Um, but direction for us is basically just being able to once you start to rotate, maintaining that kind of that spine angle. Um, throughout your swing. So you're not going to pull off or anything like that. And 40 motions got a really cool metric um, on there just to give them a shout out called spine stability. And uh, that's essentially what it's measuring is how much elevation up or down or how much, how much is changing um, as you're rotating. 40 motion. That's one I've actually, I've never messed around with much. Uh, it's mainly been K vest for, for me. What, what, what are your thoughts on the differences? It sounds like 4d you can do more with It's just, it takes more time to get it set up and, and things like that. Is that something that you use? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, 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 I've used KVEST now. I've used KVEST um, in the past. I've used 4D motion. I don't know if I'm using anything like, you know, super consistently, um, you know, right now, just because we have simplified a ton, um, and kind of our definitions and, and what we're looking for. 4D, I think is, a, it's, it's a pretty good, pretty good way to describe it. I don't know if I've had, I don't know if I've ever had anybody say KVEST is like easy to use because it crashes so often and there's some other 
like tech bugs and, and things like that, um, that they can then, unless you're patient, you know, you're constantly trying to reset it. It may have gotten better since last time I used it. So I apologize to KVS if, uh, if I'm making, <laughs> making it look bad. Um, on the flip side, 4D motion has equal amount of problems. The sensors don't always connect to the iPad. Um, you know, the, the newer sensors I've heard are really, really good. I don't, I haven't, I don't have experience with those. Um, but the old ones, you know, you'd have some connection problems or like they die and, you know, they wouldn't charge in the charging port, all kinds of stuff. Anytime you have tech, right. There's going to be some kind of issue, um, you know, with that. So I agree with you. I think with 40 motion, you can do a lot more, um, KVest, if you have the cloud, you can access it a little bit differently. 40 motion, it's all on the, all on your phone and app. So like you can have, use it with an iPad and check it on your phone and airplane later. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of benefit. So, you were in the uh, the private sector before professional baseball. And now you're back in the private sector again. What's the biggest difference between who you are now as a coach working in the private sector versus before your experience in professional baseball? Um, man, that's a really good question. Uh, I think it just honestly, like we all in. in we're similar in kind of, I think similar in age, I think similar in, in a lot of the ways we came up on social media. I'm sure we're noticing a lot of the, a lot of the people around our, um, our generation of coaches for lack of a better term, um, that have kind of morphed from what they used to do into how they promote themselves now. Right. And I think it's just, uh, it's just like an understanding of, you know, we're going to continue to grow. There's a lot of things, I think professional baseball, uh, opened my eyes to like how many really, really good communicators there are in the game that are not very technical. Um, you know, and I think, I think appreciating how they communicate and like their relationships with players, um, and, and how they, how they're able to get players to believe in themselves. I was something I think I, I thought I was really good at, but it was a lot easier to do when people were like coming specifically to see you, like they had the expectation that you were going to be the guy. And I'm sure it's the same in your, in your world too. Like, I want to go see, I want to go see Patrick. Like he's going to tell me, he's going to give me the info and professional baseball. It's all about report. And so giving unsolicited advice, you know, you walk into a cage in spring training and um, spring training is a little different. Cause I don't know. Uh, I don't know how many coaches are, are great at like maybe just pausing. And that was something that I noticed just, uh, just observationally is you get a guy who's day one in spring training, you got, maybe he's a prospect. He's got three or four coaches around him trying to tell him what to do. It's like, man, can we give the guy a breath? Like I'm, I'm not contributing to this conversation. And one of the challenges, you know, that I had in the organization that I was in and, and kind of with my title and background and skill set was like, well, what, what does the data say? What does the data say? And it was like, I would like hide data sometimes. It'd be like, it, it says he's fine. It says he's good. Leave him alone. Like, we don't need to, the stuff you're talking about is, is not, we don't need to look at it. Um, obviously I would say it in a more, uh, uh, maybe nicer way. Um, but a lot of times it was like, just trying to figure out like, what is the one thing this, that will help this player in that moment versus giving them, you know, 40 pages of a, of a full hitting report because we had the ability to do so. It was just constantly trying to simplify, simplify, simplify. So going back in the private sector, it was like, man, I just spent four years simplifying even more complex information and to higher level athletes, like I'm, I can simplify even further. So, um, just really focused on like, anytime we think something simple enough, like we're trying to find a way to simplify it, simplify it more. And, um, I think we did a pretty good job with that, with all of the, all of the tools that we had at our facility in South Elgin force plates, the vision stuff we had, um, 3D motion capture, bat sensors, hit track. Like we had so much information, so much data. And our reports were always written out in like in paragraphs. So we weren't, we weren't trying to give families like sexy bar graphs and pie graphs and pie charts and colorful, you know, uh, colorful sheets of paper. It was just like, Hey, here's what we saw on your movement screen. Here's what it looks like in words. Here's what your ball flight says. Here's what it looked like. It looks like in words. And it was just kind of this checkpoint paragraphs, small paragraphs. So we thought we did a good job of that. And, um, getting into professional baseball, like it was still even like too much info. Like guys are just like, cool. Like I'm so does my strength coach know my movement screen? Awesome. I'm going to go, I'm going to go do the program. Like, oh, okay, cool. Like, yeah, I know, I know I've 
I, I know I shrug out too much, like, cool, whatever. Like, what's, what, am, what are we doing about it? Like, what's the drill? Um, and I shared a client with, uh, or I shared a, a player um, with another coach who I really, really respect. I think he does a great job. Um, <laughs> and he came to me the next day, hit with him one day, came back to me the next day. And I started kind of building some context with him. And he was like, listen, I just got all the context in the entire world. I don't care about anything. I need you to just tell me what to do. And I'm going to go freaking do it. Like, don't, don't tell me anything about the why. And I think sometimes when you don't have the playing background, when you get into that role, you feel like you need to tell them why, because if I was a perennial all-star, I could just be like, yeah, do it. And they're gonna be like, oh, he's a perennial all-star. Like that's, that must be how you become a perennial all-star. Um, so I think it's just like really getting good at understanding what players care about and asking them permission to either tell them more or asking them to just say like, Hey, let me know when you want to know the why until then you were in school all day, you know, Mr. 13 year old kid, like you did your math test today, your social studies test. So like, you're here to bank baseball is like, let's get to work. Like we're going to do the program. You, you tell me what you need. So I think, I think we're a lot better at systematizing and scaling like that relationship um, and systematizing making players like self-reflect versus just systematizing like the drill work. Mm, yeah. That's all good stuff. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it really is comes down to like, sometimes just asking the player, like, how do you want to receive feedback? Like, how do you want me to, to communicate with you? Do you want to try to figure it out first? Or do you want me to, to say something um, as soon as I, you know, see something going on? And so I think that's, those are all really valid points. Um, what are, what are the ages you're working with right now? Um, similar to last time, you know, I was in the private sector, we get, I, I try my best to, to get, take the, tell the young kids, um, you know, direct them to our drill library or see what I can do for them, you know, either virtually with dad to get them to kind of go do their own thing. Like, see if he really likes it before you go down this route. Cause I do think there's some problems with the industry there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I think anybody's, anybody in this realm, you're going to see a lot of 13 to 15 year olds, um, just kind of like kids getting ready for high school, kids kind of like starting to get to their freshman year, maybe realizing they don't have some of the tools that some of their competition has. Um, but we work with players as, you know, all the way from youth, all the way up to pro. So we like, we have got pro guys coming in tomorrow and, um, so it's, it's a, it's a cool journey. It's, I, th I think like we still do a really good job. That was our biggest strength at our, at our old place was kind of that social learning environment, like kind of combining ages and groups and letting like the older guys kind of like drop some wisdom down and the younger guys and the younger guys eventually growing into those roles to then drop that wisdom back down. Like just that kind of that coming of age tale. So um, we've been able to maintain that kind of like clubhouse culture. And that's, that's been, that's been awesome. Do you still not allow parents to watch? <laughs> uh, no, I, um, I do. So, um, I changed that. I changed my mind on that a, a while ago. Um, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of reasons for why I went down that road. That was like a, a hard, fast stop for us. It was um, probably just like a lack of patience on my part. Um, you know, parents are a huge part of this journey for, for players and, um, I think we just need to do a better job of communicating with them, like what the expectations are, if they are going to watch. Um, and also just like appreciating like their concern and their curiosity um, and and what their, what their fears are, right? Like they're saying something because they're fearful, like their player isn't doing it right. So making sure like they define like what right is. I think like qualifying families and giving them like upfront expectations about like what's going to happen in the session versus just like allowing people to book and then getting them in the cage and trying to like, match their expectations right so um i think when you get parents who are they're expecting to go to the cage and they're expecting you to spoon feed their kid and then when you're not spoon feeding them the information they want you to spoon feed them they have a tendency to speak up or try to like fix that frustration um when you explain to them like how social learning works how uh we're going to create a lot of autonomy how we want the player to self-reflect we're how we're um you know the simple version of uh, self-organization, things of that nature, you know, I think they're like, oh, okay. Um, so we do allow parents to kind of be in that room. And uh, I ask them better questions, I think, than I have in the past, but I think appreciating them for their role in the journey, obviously the the resource, you know, that they provide in transportation and finance and all the other things. Um, 
I didn't want to didn't want to keep locking them out. Yeah, no, I thought that I, I vividly remember you, you saying that last time we had, we had uh, we had you on the podcast. But I, I I do like how you talked about you know qualifying uh, them. That's something that I I do now is before I start like working with anybody on a regular basis, like I, I just have them come up and we just kind of just see if there's, see if it's going to work basically. Right. Like that first session, like see if there's connection between me and, and the really the whole family, like the parents and the kid. And, and sometimes, you know, it, it doesn't, sometimes it's not going to be that, that right fit. And so it's, it's good to know that ahead of time before uh, you start, you know, implementing everything that you're doing with them too. So that's a good point. Yeah. And I think it's just like, I think again, like we've, we've gotten a lot better, you know, I've been talking about scaling a lot, you know, you mentioned, you know, some of the stuff I've been posting and um, like trying to scale the relationships, like how do our coaches, because we have a staff of coaches now and it's, um, it's scaling, like, how do, how do our coaches speak to families? Like, what are the intros like? Like, how do we, how do we have, what are the, what are the key components of a good introduction? doesn't mean you have to, you know, read a script. You just have to know, like, what you're going to explain the questions you're going to ask, what you expect out of the player, what do you expect out of the parents and what kind of information are we going to deliver? Um, and then same thing, like, do we conclude every lesson? Like, do we know or, or hitting session, right? Like, do we have, Hey, what did we talk about today? What stood out to you? Like, is there something I said that really resonated that we can pick up for the next time? Um, just having some of those more scalable like checkpoints and, and making sure that it's not just like, okay, Hey, I hired a coach, I put him through maybe a biomechanics course, or I put him through, I let him shadow me for a little bit. And then I just like, let him roll. Um, or maybe he's got a great playing background. And like, I just said, Hey, get to it. Like, you know, it becomes that, that kind of menu of coaches, um, that a lot of facilities go through, like, Hey, we've got this player that here's his, or this coach, here's his resume, this coach, here's his resume, this coach, here's his resume. And in pro ball, it's a little bit like that too. You try to scale it. Um, but you've got strength in their kind of silo. You've got medical in their silo. You've got each level trying to figure out their level, their group of guys. And then you get another player who maybe got called up or sent back down or whatever else. And you're trying to figure out, you know, what to do. And I think you can scale communication. And I think you can scale the simplicity of like the content you're trying to share. And if I've learned anything, you know, across all levels is that everything matters and absolutely nothing matters. Like the stuff that you want to get into the weeds about and that you want to like the hill you want to die on, like it's just not worth it. It's not worth straining relationships over. Um, it's not worth arguing with people on social media. It's not worth like, you know, questioning yourself. Like, it's just, it's really about, like you said, like qualifying, you know, the, the conversation and um, making sure that, because you can qualify, you can qualify the conversation too, right? Like, I think that's, does this conversation need to happen right now? Is this the right time for the conversation? And a lot of times, like whether it's a dad and his kid that needs just a little fist bump or whether it's a pro player that just needs you to put, you know, his arm, your arm around him. And that happens a ton in professional baseball. I think there's like this, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, there's like this stigma. I talk to players and like parents are like, yeah, look at him. He's so confident. Like to be a pro guy, you got to be confident. I'm like, man, I promise you, he's got a ton of self doubt. He just might have some mental strategies to overcome it. Or like, he's just really good and he's overcoming it. Anybody's like you, you being 12 years old, 13 years old, 14 years old, like doesn't mean that you don't have self doubt. Like it, it it's totally normal. And I think our, our culture of achievement is, um, is like really just creating this fear of missing out. Like, Oh, I didn't go three for three today. And like, par like players and parents are panicking because they're not on a perfect game ranking or maybe they thought like somebody was going to be there or, and it's like, man, like it just doesn't matter. Like life is not about like that. Like, are you enjoying your journey? Like, did you enjoy competing? Like, did you enjoy putting on a Jersey and playing with your friends? Did you enjoy like, did, did you enjoy hustling out? You know, I don't care that you hit a, that hit a 40 bouncer. Like, did you enjoy the grind of trying to beat that infielder and competing against him? Like guy was throwing hard at it. Did you enjoy competing against that velocity? Like, yeah, you didn't win, but I might be disappointed, but did you enjoy that part of it? And if you can't enjoy those moments, I think that's, I think we have a lot of kids who aren't enjoying those moments right now because of the culture we've created. Mm, yeah. Good stuff. I, um, I don't know, maybe like a month or so ago, go, uh, we had Michael Kadire on. And one of the things he shared was, he's like, there legitimately wasn't one day I was in the major leagues over 15 years that I, that I didn't have some insecurity at some point 
during the day. And I was like, man, that's, that's interesting. Right. And so it's like, to your point, yeah, that 13 year old, he's going to, he's going to probably have some too, right? If, if you got a grown man, who's 35 years old with 15 years of, of experience in the big leagues going through that, like you're probably going to have that same thing at, at 13 or 14 or whatever. Um, what's your, what's your take on player goals? I saw you post some content lately on, on goals um, on Twitter. Like, can you t- walk me through like what, what your, um, how you view goals for players? Like what should they be focused on? Should they even have goals? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. Um, are you referring to that? Uh, my most recent yeah. post kind yeah. of the journey. Yeah. I think, um, I think of it as like, you know, I guess some of that stemmed from, I've been having a lot of conversations with people who were in professional baseball and kind of got there and it wasn't what they expected it to be, whether it was a player it's been coaches. It's been, they get there and they're like, this is not what I thought it was going to be. Like I have this huge dream to get here and now it's not what I thought. And they start second guessing, like just that goal in general, it became just like a destination. And I think it's like your, your goal isn't just to get there. Your goal is to like survive it. Right. And part of that means if things aren't going perfectly because of leadership or because there's maybe not alignment and everything you want to do, like, can you be a good clubhouse guy and can you survive the organization? Um, similarly to like, if I'm just, con- if I'm just, if I'm a player and I'm just trying to play college baseball, like I, I need to, I need to survive 14 you first. I need to make my high school team first. Like I need to, I need to have kind of these check boxes and like your goals are great. Like getting to the top of the mountain is great. But like, once you're there, like, you're really not at the top of the mountain until you stop playing. Like at some point, like that's your peak, like you're done. And we have to enjoy the climb. We have to enjoy the journey. Like our goals should be, you know, like like more holistic, right? Like I want to keep playing the game. Not, I want to get to a certain level. Like I want to keep playing. And I think about like the indie ball lifers and the guys who got out of college and are 27, 28, 29, like indie ball guys, like they're winning. Right. Like we look at them and like, oh, man, like you're making nothing pennies. But like, that's what they want to do. Like they're like another day, another year under the sun, boys. Like that's their journey. That's their climb. And like they still have the goal of maybe being picked up in affiliated baseball, whether it's realistic or not. Um, but they're enjoying that journey and they're clawing and climbing towards that journey and towards those goals. Um, and again, it comes down to like, can you enjoy the journey? Like, I think that is the goal. Um and figuring out how not to make your goals a destination. Your goals are more check checkpoints than they are like a destination. Mm, I like that. I like that. What made you think about it in that way? Is that you just, did you see like over time players, like they wanted to hit a specific number or get, you know, make a certain amount of money. And then it's like, they did it and they kind of felt like defeated. Yeah. I think it's observing the industry again. Like I said, it was talking with coaches who were, have opportunities to to grow in this game or are, are, are young um and we're just kind of like i don't know it wasn't what i expected like i don't want to do it um players similarly you know retiring probably just because it, it wasn't easy right um and everyone's obviously entitled to their quality of life and like what they want to do and things of that nature but it's also just that like what's next mindset like i think i don't think enough people are present I know I've gone through that, you know, myself, especially in leadership opportunities, you and I have had conversations about um, different opportunities and and things like that. It's like, okay, I'm here. How do I get to here? And you spend so much time thinking about getting to here, you forget that you're there. And it's like, how do we be present in our journey and make sure that we don't miss a moment? And I think some of that comes from being a dad and like watching my kids grow up and like, oh my gosh, they're six and four already. And like, all those kind of things. And I think it's just, again, like you said, observing the industry and like, okay, I'm top ranked on PBR. Like now what? It's like, you're still not good yet. Like, do you enjoy the work or like, is this just like a cool thing to go show off in your friends in high school? Like, do, cause you're not done yet. You're not that good yet. You're not done yet. Like in two years, nobody's going to care that you were on PBR. No one's going to care that you were on the hit tracks leaderboards. No one's going to care if you hit the ball hundred, like it similarly to, to, myself as well like if like I can have this business I can have the the pedigree that I have you know being a a former assistant you know White Sox hitting coordinator and all the things and all the things we achieved in those four years and kind of the scope that they're still on and some of the things that are still in place and like it's really cool but like if I were to imagine I had like a 
I don't have a son, but if I had a son uh, or my daughters, you know, and I went to go coach their team and, or they played on a team in maybe 15 years or something like their high school team. And I was like, well, I used to be the former assistant. And like the coach is going to be like, dude, you're not relevant anymore. I don't care. I don't care that you were that. Like, I'm trying to coach this team right now. Like what you have to say, doesn't matter. Um, and so I think it's just recognizing that like the season of life that you're in, like you just have to be present in it. And um, like at the end of the day, like everything matters and nothing matters. Like titles don't matter. Like experiences only, it only matters if you're enjoying the journey. Like it's not just like something you flash around on a resume because nobody cares. A lot of really good points there. And I, I do like how you continue to emphasize like being present and I think that's something from a hitting standpoint. Like, I think that should be the goal as a hitter. Like, are you present in the box? Right. Because if you're thinking about anything else, like gets going on outside, like you're done. And so like being present and being able to focus is, is so important. Um, what are some ways that you've been able to help hitters like be present in the box? Yeah. Rob Cypher's got, um, He's the mental skills guy in the minor leagues for the White Sox. Um, really awesome dude. Um, he's got some a good video on our website as well. Uh, that's that's up there. Um, but he kind of talks about five steps. And the first step is like to recognize you're having an unproductive thought. So unproductive thought is, you know, man, don't strike out. Uh, I wonder what he's going to throw me. Um, it might not be like, oh, I stink. It might not be like, oh, I'm already out. Or man, it could just anything unproductive. So defining what unproductive is for that hitter. Um, and then he has them picture a stop sign. So he has them kind of like close their eyes and picture a stop sign. And when he explains it to players, he says, what does it look like? How many sizes does it have? What are the letters on it? What color are the letters? So like they really are forced to picture it in their mind. Um, and then he has them uh, take a breath. Uh, then there's a physical reset. So like whether that's like slapping your slapping your leg, like hard enough to feel a sting, whether it's taking your bat, hitting your shoe, something to like kind of sting your body, just kind of like reset. Um, and then it's a positive thought and that positive thoughts, like typically external, like I'm going to, I'm going to hit a line drive to center. Like I'm, I'm crushing this ball, like double left center. I'm going double, double oppo, like whatever that is. And, um, that takes, you know, as I'm explaining, it, it takes a little bit longer when hitters do it. Um, they can, it, it takes just like a normal step out, take a breath type deal. It doesn't look like anything different. Um, you know, from there. So we actually practice that in our cage. I have the steps written down on uh, the back of my garage, which is um, just like at the basically created a whiteboard, um, but it's just the garage door. <laughs> so I've got those steps like written down. And um, when players talking about mental skills or that they're not feeling present or not feeling confident um, as I'm feeding machine or throwing to them or whatever, like we like step out and we actually physically practice that. Um, Sean Sherman's got another one in terms of like a central nervous system reset. He wants guys to kind of step out. He wants you to keep your head towards the pitcher, but take your eyes and look towards like your pull side foul pole. So you're looking either left or right, depending on your, if you're a righty or lefty and you pull them as far as you possibly can take a big breath and then come back. Um, and I've been teaching players kind of like that strategy as well. Um, and there's some players that really enjoy kind of more of the central nervous system reset. And there's some players that enjoy more of that kind of like self-reflection five steps, um, you know, process through there. And then we just physically practice it. Like, Hey, did you do your reset? Like, you know, quality over quantity. I'm not just going to sit here and feed the machine. Like let's work on something. Mm. Man, that's good stuff, dude. Really good stuff. Um, what, what are some things that you would want to leave coaches with today? Like, is there anything else that you think that coaches out there are going to be listening to this that they should know or they should continue to emphasize or not emphasize to their players? Um, the biggest thing that I've been talking with coaches about and kind of um, you could probably sense by just the tone of, you know, some of my social media and just even this call and things like that is, um, it's more about like how you're coaching versus like what you're coaching. And so I think one thing I've noticed a lot that I've been talking with, with families about is we live in an industry where players show up and they're expecting to be spoon fed, right? They go to high school practice, their coach has a plan. They go to their private hitting coach, their coach has a plan. They go to hit with dad, dad has a plan, right? There's not really a lot of opportunities for them to self-reflect and figure out what they want to work on and what they're feeling. They just like do the plan. And the plan isn't always conducive to like what they're feeling and what they're doing. And so um, I think coaches can ask better questions because I don't think a lot of players understand. Like, I don't think they get 
to a lot of the, even the first phase of motor learning, which is understanding the move, right? And I hate to, I'm not, not to be like the move, right? Like I'm not the move guy, very <laughs> logical dynamic base. Like, don't quote me on that. Um, but like, you know, the, the movements they want to make, right? Like they're at their athleticism. Like they just have no feel over it because they've just been spoon fed and been trying to drive their back knee or, you know, snap it or um, pull through the center, like, you know, creates anything, any possible cue, like it, it like means something very unique to them. And like, they try to do it in this way that they're like, I don't know, when you ask them, why are you doing that? They're like, uh, they like guess. So I don't pull off. Okay. Well, how is that making you not pull off? Uh, I don't know. So making sure like we can make ourselves basically trying to make ourselves irrelevant, like let the player be the best coach. Cause we talk about it all the time and it's coaches. I think coaches are notorious for this. They're notorious for yelling at players. Um, they're notorious for yelling at players for doing something they didn't prepare them for, or for not doing something they didn't prepare them for. And I think they're like, we've been working. It's, it's all up to you guys. You know, we can only teach you guys so much. You got to get in, you got to do it on your own and you got to do this and you got to do that. And it's the, and then like, you're still just like spoon feeding them this like motivation. Like at what point, like, does it become intrinsic? Like at what point does the player like, just want to like do the thing? Um, and I think figuring like them knowing like they've got to feel it and it's got to be their journey. And like, that's how they can be present. I think is what we need to be doing as a whole entire industry industry to prepare these young men for what their futures hold. And that's, and that's uh, hard to do. Like if you're coaching high school baseball and you have, you know, an hour and a half, a couple of days a week in a cage, like, cause I've been there before. It's, it's tough, right? It, it's, it's, it's tough. I think time is one of the things that you, is an asset in professional baseball and sometimes in high school baseball, it's, you know, it's the enemy, right? You only have so much time. Um, how would you go about that? If you were a high school coach and you didn't have that much time, like with what you just said about getting players to essentially be their own hitting coach, like how would you go about doing that with the limited time and just resources you may have? So if it were me, um, I would hammer the hinge I would hammer side bend and that would be it. You know, I think there'd be some other things that might come up on an individual level or some different, different things, but I would just pick, I would pick one or two things that I really want to do from an organization. And if obviously if I knew I was going to be there for a while, um, I would potentially even have like my freshman class focus on like just that and then get like add one more thing at the sophomore level and then add one more thing at the, at the varsity level. So over the course of three years, we're really trying to build, you know, swings that can maintain direction through the middle of the field with some juice, right? Um, make sure that they really uh, know what their routine is, um, like quiz them on their routines, give them opportunities to tell me like what their routines are, have open gym time if I could. Um, you know, as I'm watching players in the, because I know there's like different rules in different states and things like that, but having that meeting like, hey, I want you to write down your routine for me. Like an exercise we're going to do is, out of all the drills I've showed you, um, you know, maybe this fall, what are you going to do this off season when you come to the cage by yourself? Which ones did you like? I showed you eight drills. I need you to pick three for your routine and just add batting practice on the end of it. Right. So how are you going to do that? And then I want you to write down next to that, why you're doing that. And I think it'll give you a lot of insight into how you're explaining drills. And I tell players all the time, if, if you don't understand, if you, if you, if you can't tell me why we're doing something, I ask them, is it your fault or my fault? And they stare at me with like, like I have eight heads the first time I ask this question. And they're like nervous to say that it's my fault. And so they very shy. They're like, my, my fault? I'm like, no, it's not your fault. Who, who's, who's communicating right now? Like uh, you? I'm like, okay. So as a communicator, it's my job to make sure I communicate effectively. If you don't understand it, I, it something didn't connect. Now, does that mean you maybe were like staring off in space for that little minute? Sure, but it's still my job to make sure that I bring you back to earth and I explain this to you. Now it's your job to like try to understand it. Your job is just to try. If you don't, it's my it's my fault. And then that's kind of like how I kind of go about it. Now, again, with time and individuals and all the other things, I think it also comes down to like scaling your coaches. Like, do you have a freshman coach who understands that? Do you have a sophomore coach who understands that? Because those guys are going to have less players and different things. And you just start putting these things that you do as an organization, like, Hey, we, we talk about our routines. This is what we do. 
we talk about it. We ask players, we, we make them write it down. We make them try to understand it. We have, when we do our meetings, instead of exp- maybe, maybe our, our team meetings at the end of the games, maybe they're not me just going over and explaining, Hey, we got ourselves out today, guys. You know, we chased too many breaking balls in the dirt and we made too many errors in the field and our pitchers got to throw strikes and everybody, you know, as Domingo Ayala would say, be like, yeah, coach, I was there. I'm just hungry. <laughs> like I was like, right. Like I was at the game. I, I watched all of this happen. Like, why am I in the outfield on left field right now? And so it's like, you know, asking them, you know, some of the leaders are asking those guys like, um, or even not having the meetings after the game, like let them go home, let them get refreshed, like talk about it the next day at practice or before the next game. That's what happened in pro ball, right? Like there's not like the post game left field meeting in professional baseball. Um, so taking your notes, letting everyone kind of marinate on it. And then coming back and like letting the team tell you what happened. Right. And then you've got your notes that you want to make sure you go over. So if they don't hit those points, you know, you bring them in at the end. And then that's your way of teaching the game because high school kids are going to be need to, they need to be taught the game. Rookie ball guys need to be taught the game. Double A guys need to be taught the game. Triple A guys need to be taught the game. Young major leaguers need to be taught the game. Like, you know, um, so I don't know that I, I kind of rambled on that, but I think it's about, just to kind of put it in a nutshell as I was processing this out loud is, you know, scale your coaches, make sure your coaches know what you care about, ask the players and, and then just, and then put things in your practice plan in your fall and your uh, off season development, like put those little like note cards, give everyone a note card, whatever it is, like let them know what you did. And the way that I would scale drills at, at in a large group is I would teach one drill a day, um, one drill a day for seven days. And you've got seven drills right there. And then at the end of it, you just kind of go back and you make sure that they understood fully what that drill's about. You understand, you know, whether maybe, maybe it's just angled machine. And then like, as they're doing it on the field, like you're walking around and you're being like, Hey, do you know why we're doing this? Why, why do you think you're doing it? How do you think it's going to help your swing? And then it's like, they stare at you and you got other kids, you pat them on the shoulder, be like, Hey, I'm going to come back in five minutes. I just want you to just kind of reflect on it. There's no right or wrong answer. I just want to hear what you got to say. Mm. right and then like then now the conversations are going to start changing around the cage because you around the the turtle right because now those high school players can be like hey man like what do you think this is for i don't know my uh, my hitting coach says this da 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 like oh man i go to this guy he says this now they're talking about hitting like there's a guy i think his name is kevin wilson um is that the is that the good batting guy on twitter the yeah conversation yeah like that's his big thing like hitting is a conversation like young players don't talk about their swings young players are told about their swings young players don't talk about their swings professionals talk about their swings how do we make it more of a conversation on the hitting development side and i think we're talking specifically hitting because that's you know our niche but um i mean that's at anything right? right like i think pitching ground balls defense life like just what's meaningful and, and what matters to that player and then i think it makes like the journey a lot a lot better too like everyone's kind of doing it together Ryan, you're the man, dude. One of the best in the business, and this episode's another reason why. I appreciate you. Uh, that was that was phenomenal. Great stuff. I think it's going to definitely impact a lot of people, myself already included. So I appreciate you, and appreciate you coming on, man. Well, thanks for letting me uh, kind of process that out loud. I kind of like not having the questions ahead of time because that's how my brain works. That's how I ramble is uh, as I think of things. I don't pause. I just keep talking and um so thanks for bringing some of that some of that out because that was that was good stuff i really appreciate man always love coming on and if you guys haven't already by the way the michael coutier episode is awesome you guys should definitely uh download that one after you listen to this (laughs) hey lastly before i do forget if someone wants to contact you follow you what what's the best way to go about that uh, my Twitter is RPJ1317. Um, otherwise, just my website to www.johansonbaseball.com. Um, and there's tons of like free content from when we did a bunch of, uh, you might have been on, you might have spoken at, at that actually, now I think about it. Um, uh, COVID, um, all those COVID videos and, and whatnot under our uh, about tab. So, Sweet.